Welcome everyone, uh, welcome to this uh, course Expansive Soil. Today will be the second module of this course and it will be the fourth lecture of this course Expansive Soil. Uh, this module will be dealing with uh, the clay mineralogy and in this lecture we will be discussing about the introduction to clay mineralogy. In the previous classes we learned about uh, the soil behavior, some engineering behavior, the plasticity behavior the soil classification and the soil formation, how the soils are formed from the rock and how do they classify into different groups and their engineering behavior. So, when you talk about engineering behavior, most of the soils behave due to their grain to grain contact, so that is known as effective stress. So, engineering behavior such as consolidation, shear strength all depends on their grain to grain uh, contact or the effective stress, but some of the soils behavior like plasticity all depends on the clay mineralogy. So, when we deal about the clay mineralogy, we deal about the minute particles which are inside the soil which controls the soil behavior. In this lecture, we will learn about different types of minerals and how do they are characterized. When we say minerals, so mineral can be defined as a naturally occurring chemical elements or compound which is a chemical composition or which is a chemical form formula which is formed by a geological process. The elements contained in the earth crust such as oxygen, silicon, hydrogen and aluminum along with different cations such as calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium and carbon are organized into crystalline form to for form common minerals. Generally, minerals are like uh, clay minerals and non-clay minerals depending on the part size of the particles. But most of the clay minerals are uh, pl uh, platy in shapes whereas non-clay minerals are bulky in shapes. And not all the clay minerals are less than 2 micron whereas not all the bulky minerals of non-clay minerals are larger than 2 micron. When we talked about the clay minerals, the clay minerals are made of phyllosilicates which are the parallel sheet of the silicates and the clay soils are formed by the chemical weathering of the clay minerals. The clay minerals are aluminum silicates that is oxides of aluminum and silicon with a smaller amount of metal substituted into them. The aluminum and oxygen combinations are the basic structure units which are bonded together which are bonded together uh, in such a way that the sheets of one unit is formed. The mineralogy controls the shape and properties of the clay soils where the clay soils, uh, the clay minerals are mostly distinguished by their small particle size, net negative charge and the plasticity characteristics. In order to understand the soil behavior, we need to understand the clay mineralogy, how they are formed and what is their composition. So, we will go one by one on how these clays are formed. Generally, based on their origin, the clays can be divided into two groups. One is known as the primary group, second one is known as the secondary groups or the primary minerals or the secondary minerals. The primary minerals are the minerals which has not been altered chemically since the, their time of crystallization from the molten lava and subsequent deposition. Few of the examples are quartz, feldspars. These minerals are mostly found in coarse grain soils like uh, uh, quartz and feldspars and mica. Similarly, the secondary minerals are the minerals which originates from the decomposition of the primary minerals and subsequent re-precipitation into new chemically distinct formula. Secondary minerals are mostly active in comparison to the primary minerals. So, there are many secondary minerals, the few examples which we will be dealing in this course are the kaolinite, elite and montmolinite. The composition of the soil minerals varies and depends upon the rocks from which they are derived. Since the rocks are mostly composed of the element oxygen, silicon, aluminum and these minerals usually found in the soil minerals. Then we will talk about the different uh, units of the clay minerals. 
Generally, the clay minerals has two units. One is known as tetrahedral unit, and the second one is an octahedral unit. In the tetrahedral units, there are four oxygen atoms. You can see this is oxygen atoms occupying the four uh, apex position over here, and one silicon atom which will be at the center of this tetrahedron. So, this will be a tetrahedral unit. The oxygens uh, are occupying at a uniform distance from each other. Generally, this is 2.6 angstrom from each other and the silicon atom also present at an equidistance from the different uh, oxygen uh, atoms. The sheets has a thickness of 4.93 angstrom generally and the oxygen to oxygen atoms distance is 2.6 angstrom leaving a hole within the tetrahedron of 0.53 angstrom into which the silicon atom of 0.5 angstrom fits into quite easily. This silicon atom is equidistant from all of this uh, oxygen atoms. The tetrahedrons are arranged to form a hexagonal network which are repeated infinitely in both horizontal direction to form a tetrahedral sheets. So, when we talk about the negative net negative charges, we can see there are four oxygen atoms uh, with charge of minus 2 over here. So, altogether it becomes uh, minus 2, minus 6, so it becomes minus 8 and there will be a silicon atom of plus 4 charge at the center. So, that becomes plus 4. So, the net charge on each unit becomes minus 4. Therefore, each tetrahedral unit has a net negative charge of minus 4 in it. In a tetrahedron sheet or silica sheet, the repetition of each unit takes place. Uh, for example, in, in here we can see this is one unit which is combined with another unit and it is combined with another unit. So, it will be uh, this unit will be repeated both in this direction as well as in this direction and then they will be stacking in the third direction which is known as the C direction. Here each oxygen atom is being shared by two of this tetrahedral unit. We can see this is one tetrahedral unit, this is the second tetrahedral units and both one and two units are sharing this oxygen atom among themselves. Similarly, the unit 2 and unit 3 are sharing this oxygen atoms among themselves. So, this is how the tetrahedral sheets are formed. Here again, um, this is one tetrahedral units and these are the tetrahedral sheets. We can see these are the different oxygen atoms at the apex points and the silicon atoms marked in green in the central point. When they stack together in both A and B direction that means in this and this direction they form a silica sheet or a tetrahedral sheet. So, here we can see the uh, tetrahedral sheets. There are four tetrahedral units and when, when you calculate the net charge in it, it becomes minus 4. Therefore, a tetrahedral sheets has a net ne charge of minus 4 in themselves. Generally, for all this description of the clay minerals, a tetrahedral sheets or silica sheet it is represented by this diagram. So, this is a tetrahedral unit, this is a tetrahedral unit and this forms a tetrahedral sheets. So, in between these units, there will be an hexagonal hole. So, this hexagonal holes plays an important role in the formation of some of the clay minerals. So, which I will be discussing subsequently. Next, we will talk about a octahedral unit. Octahedral unit, as the name suggests, consisting of 6 hydroxyl ion at the 6 apex point here and in between there will be one aluminum ion or this can be aluminum or this can be magnesium. So, a octahedral units consisting of 6 hydroxyl ion forming a configuration of an octahedron having one aluminum atom at the center or maybe a magnesium atom at the center. Depending on the whether it is aluminum or magnesium, the charge will be different. So, here in this case, the this is an aluminum atom and the aluminum has 3 positive charges and 6 hydroxyl has 6 negative charges. 
So, this octahedral unit has three negative charges and because of this net negative charge is negative and octahedral units cannot exist in isolation. So, they have to be formed in a group. When this aluminum is present here, since the valency is 3 of the aluminum, only two third possible positions of this are filled in order to balance the charge. When the two third of the positions are filled, the mineral is known as dioctahedral. Similarly, when we take about, talk about magnesium of plus 2 valency are present, all the three positions are filled to balance the structure of the minerals and the mineral is termed as trioctahedral. So, next uh, we will see how these minerals are formed. Here we can see, so this is a octahedral, octahedral unit with 6 uh, hydroxyl ion and 1 aluminum ion. If we calculate the net negative charge, it becomes minus 3. And this is one example of an octahedral sheets. So, these octahedral sheets are continue in A and B direction and stakes on the C direction. When this um, central atom is aluminum, this is known as gibbsite. When this central atom is magnesium, this is known as brucite. And this uh, several tetrahedron to form a gibbsite sheet and this gibbsite is, sheet is neutral in nature. If you can calculate here, the total net charge will be 0. So, therefore, the Gibbs side is electrically neutral. Next, uh, we will compare between the silica and the Gibbs side and brucite sheets. Here we can see uh, this is octahedral sheet which, which is made of the magnesium at the center. This uh, uh, is known as brucite since its magnesium is at the center. Similarly, when it is aluminum as I told you before, it will be known as Gibbs side and this is represented by this uh, diagram. Similarly, when you talk about tetrahedral sheets, we can see either the apex oxygen will be formed in this manner, either this way or maybe this way. So, depending on how this are formed, we can say this is a tips up or tips down. If it is a tips up where this apex is single single ox oxygen atoms are there, so this is known as tips up when uh, this is a tips up, the diagram becomes like this one and when the tips becomes down, it will be known as tips down or uh, this is represented by this diagram. So, this is the example of silica sheets and the silica sheets mostly written by S term, the brucite is written by B and the gibbsite is written in by Z. I can conclude that the tetrahedral and octahedral sheets are represented by this diagram and in octahedral sheets, if the aluminum is occupying the central position, this is known as Gibbs side and when aluminum are substituted by magnesium, it will be known as brucite. There, there is a term isomorphous substitution and due to this uh, mechanism, the clay uh, contains some of this negative charges. So, isomorphous substitution is defined as the mechanism in, in which one atom in a basic unit may be replaced by another atom of identical size but lower valency. In this process of isomorphous substitution, say for example, in this case one silica atom can be replaced by an aluminum atom. Say for example, in this case uh, this is a uh, tetrahedral unit where the silicon atom occupying the center position. Now, the net negative charge is minus 4 as we discussed earlier. So, what we will do is we will re, uh, replace this one by one aluminum atom. So, once we remove this silicon atom by a aluminum atom, then the net charge changes. Say for example, in this case, the net negative charge was minus 4 when it was silicon, but when it was replaced by aluminum the net negative charge becomes minus 5. So, due to this process, the net negative charges increases from minus 4 to minus 5. So, we need to understand in here that isomorphous substitution generally increases the net negative charges of the particle due to reduction in the positive charges. In this for 
uh, example, the net negative charges was increased from minus 4 to minus 5 due to a reduction in the positive charge from plus 4 to plus 3 due to the replacement of silicon by aluminum. Similarly, when magnesium atom may be replaced one aluminum atom over here and it causes a reduction in the positive charge and there will be an increase in the net negative charge. So, in this process of isomorphous substitution, most of the clay minerals exhibit some of the negative charges. Then we will discuss about the formation of different minerals. As I told you, there are two units, one is tetrahedral units and octahedral units. Mostly it has oxygen and hydroxy hydroxyl ion and different type of cations like silicon, aluminum or magnesium. Then they will be stacked together uh, and they will be formed tetrahedral and octahedral units. When this tetrahedral and octahedral units are stacked in either 1 is to 1 way or 2 is to 1 way or 2 is to 2 way, then we will find different kind of n minerals. Say for example, when it is stacked together in 1 is to 1, we have kaolinite and halocyte. When it is stacked in 2 is to 1, we have smectite, vermiculite or elite and different mixed layer. When it is stacked in 2 is to 2 way, we have chloride ion. So, we will go and we will see how these uh, minerals are formed. First, we will start with the kaolinite. Kaolinite is a 1 is to 1 mineral. 1 is to 1 means 1 gibside unit and 1 silica units. So, 1 gibside unit and 1 silica unit forms 1 kaolinite mineral. So, the distance between them is 7.2 angstrom and here the bonding between the gibside and silica is an hydrogen bonding. Due to this hydrogen bonding, the bond strength is quite large and therefore, they will not get separated by the water. Therefore, the swelling behavior of this is very less. Here we can see this is one uh, uh, oxygen atom and they react with the hydroxyl ion to form the hydrogen bonding. And this is the uh, distance of each unit which is 7.2 angstrom. This uh, unit gets repeated in both A and B direction and it will be stacked in C direction to, to form the kaolinite minerals. Here we can see these are the silica tetrahedral and the octahedral units they are stacking together. This is a form they are joined by hydrogen bonding and the thickness of this unit is around 100 to 1000 angstrom and their lateral dimensions is from 1000 to 20000 angstrom and they have a specific surface area of 15 meter square per gram. And due to this uh, hydrogen bonding, generally they are non-expansive. Here we can see this is uh, the units which stack together to form this basic sheets of kaolinite and here this is get repeated in both A direction and B direction. And it will be stacked in C direction to form this basic units of kaolinite. Generally, the cation exchange capacity of this uh, kaolinite mineral is around 3 to 15 milli equivalent per 100 gram and the liquid limit is generally 50 and it is very less active in nature and its activity is from 0 0.3 to 0 0.5. The next, uh, we will talk about the mineral halocyte. So, halocyte is also a 1 is to 1 mineral like uh, our kaolinite, but here we have one layer of water molecule is present. Due to the presence of one layer of water molecule, the distance between the unit is 10.1 angstrom. When we remove this, uh, it becomes 7.2 angstrom. So, this is 10.1 angstrom because of this addition of water layer and the cation exchange capacity of this uh, halocyte is 5 to 40 milli equivalent per 100 gram and the specific surface area is around 35 to 70 meter square per gram. The activity of this halocyte is 0 0.1 whereas for dehydrate one is yields 0 0.5. So, generally the dehydrated one is more active in comparison to the hydrated halocyte mineral. Next, uh, we will talk about uh, uh, the elite which is a 2 is to 1 mineral 
2 stands for 2 silica units, in between there will be 1 gypside units. And in between this units there will be potassium ions. Now this potassium ions are perfectly fit into the hexagonal hole of the silica units. Since uh, this potassium ion fit perfectly into the hexagonal hole of the silica units, the swelling behavior of this soil is very less. But the swelling is more than the kaolinite, but it is very less in comparison to montmolinite. So, this is the atomic structure of the elite mineral. We can see over here, this is one oxygen atoms, this is the potassium ion which is perfectly fitting into this hexagonal holes. These are the aluminum magnesium ions. We can see in this elite, uh, elite uh, minerals the potassium ions are occupying this position and these are fitting perfectly well into the hexagonal holes. And the potassium ion which has a radius of 1.33 angstrom fit perfectly well into the hexagonal hole which is 1.32 angstrom. Therefore, the swelling of this mineral is very less but higher than kaolinite mineral. When we talk about this uh, sheets of elite, the basic units are uh, arranged in both A direction and B direction and it will be staked in the C direction to form the uh, elite mineral. The lateral dimension of elite is about the same of like montomolite of 1000 to 5000 angstrom, but the thickness is greater than the montomolite, it is from 50 to 500 angstrom and it has a specific surface area of 80 meter square per gram and their liquid limit varies from 120 percent to 80 percent and the activity varies from 0.5 to 1.3. So, in comparison to kaolinite mineral, elite is more active, but it is less active in comparison to montomolite mineral. Next is the vermiculite minerals. Vermiculite mineral is similar to 2 is to 1 structure. So, we can see one silica, uh, 2 silica units in between 1 aluminum unit. So, aluminum unit is sandwiched by 2 silica units and in between we have some exchangeable cations such as calcium and magnesium and these are separated by 2 layers of water molecules. Depending on the layers of the water molecules, the thickness is from ranges from 10 to 14 angstrom. When we dry this vermiculite, this vermiculite generally loses its water and the spacing reduced to 10 angstrom. But again when we expose this to the moisture, the mineral absorbs moisture quickly and again it regains its spacing of 14 angstrom. In vermiculite, the dominant cation is mostly magnesium and generally Vermiculite has a very high uh, cation exchange capacity which is ranging from 100 to 150 milli equivalent per 100 gram. Next comes the montmolinite. So, montmolinite is a 2 is to 1 mineral that is one gypside unit is sandwiched between 2 silica units and in between the 2 units there is water molecules and different type of exchangeable cations. This exchangeable cations can be sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium and depending on the type of exchangeable cations, the swelling tendency of montomolite will be different. Similarly, depending on the number of water molecules over here, the thickness of each unit ranges from 9.6 angstrom to infinity. Generally, the bonding between these two units are like van der Waal forces which is very weak in nature and therefore, the water can easily go into this units and because of this it expands in the volume and as a result it swells significantly. Here we can see the structure of this montomolite. Here is one silica units, in between there is a gypside units which is occupied by aluminum. Then these are the again was silica units, this is silicon atoms this is oxygen and they forms one montomolite of 2 is to 1 arrangement. And in between we have exchangeable cations which can be magnesium, 
or sodium, potassium or calcium. Going by the units and the montomolite sheets, the montomolite sheets are formed by stacking of this montomolite units in both A and B direction, it is repeated in both A and B direction and stacked in C direction. Each unit has a thickness of 10 angstrom and in between this we have some exchangeable cations and water molecules. The cation exchange capacity of montomolite varies from 80 to 150 milli equivalent per 100 gram and it has a lateral dimensions of 1000 to 5000 angstrom and thickness is very less in comparison to other minerals. Therefore, it has a high specific surface area of 800 meter square per gram. Depending on the type of exchangeable cations, the activity also varies. When the dominant type of exchangeable cations is sodium, in that case the activity is quite high and can be from 4 to 7. When most of the exchangeable cations are sodium, then the mineral will be known as sodium montomolite. When it is calcium, it is known as calcium montomolite and in that case the activity will be around 1.5. And similarly, the swelling ten tendency also depends on what kind of exchangeable cation it has. If the exchangeable cation is sodium, in that case the swelling tendency will be significantly higher and if it is calcium, then it will be significantly less. Chloride is made of uh, minerals like silicon, aluminum and silicon units and in, in between again one aluminum is there and the thickness is around 14 angstrom. Generally chloride is present along with other clay minerals and they have a cation exchange capacity of 10 to 14 milli equivalent per 100 gram. This is a basic uh, unit cells of chloride as uh, given by Young. You can see these are repeated along the A direction and B direction and stacked in C direction. So apart from these minerals, we have few other minerals uh, like allofen, Allofen is consisting of a, rend a random arrangement of silica tetrahedron and uh, the metallic ions mostly aluminum in octahedral coordinations and allofens are mostly identified by the absence of extra diffraction line and uh, this uh, allofen exhibits very high uh, activity. So this is all about different uh, minerals which are present in a soil or in a clay. Next question is these minerals are so small then how do we identify them? So there are different techniques available by which we can identify the minerals present in a soil. Say for example, a soil which is made of three things or which can be uh, divided into three things based on their particle size, sand, silt and clay. The sand minerals can be identified using a microscope. Similarly, for silt, uh, the minerals can be identified using a light microscope or a X-ray diffraction technique. Similarly, for a clay soil, we can use different techniques to find out the clay minerals. Since for the clay minerals, mostly the particle size is less than 2 microns, so we have to use different techniques. But before going for the different techniques, it has to go th through some pre-treatment, say for example washing with uh, magnesium chloride and removing the excess salt, then it has to go either through X-ray diffraction technique or differential thermal analysis or scanning electron microscope or infrared spectroscopy to identify what kind of minerals it has. If we are using the X-ray diffraction technique, then we have to do it with air dry sample, with gristle saturated sample then soil saturated with potassium and then air drying and 500 degrees centigrade heated samples. If we are using the differential thermal analysis, then it has to be carried out on air dry sample. Similarly, scanning electron microscope uh, and infrared spectroscopy can be used to identify the clay minerals present in a clay. So just I uh, will go as a little bit about uh, the different methods. Uh, mostly we use the X-ray diffraction technique for identification of the clay mineralogy. In X-ray diffraction techniques, the material is exposed to a filter X-ray beam which you can see here. These are the X-ray beam A, B, C. 
the beam passes into material and causes the electron in the atoms of the mineral to vibrate and reflect the beam through a successive planes. Here we can see the beams are getting reflected. The method involves increasing the incidence angle and monitoring the intensity of the diffracted X-ray radiation until a maximum value of diffracted intensity is achieved. This X-ray diffraction maximum maximum is detected whenever the following equation is satisfied. So, we will use this equation to find out different D spacing. For example, the kaolinite basal spacing is about 7.2 angstrom is insensi insensitive to drying or moderate heating. Heating, but heating up to 500 degrees centigrade destroyed the kaolinite minerals but not the other clay minerals. So, therefore, we can identify, identify from them. Similarly, elite is characterized by displacing of 10 angstrom which remains fixed both in the presence of polar liquids after drying. Montmolite minerals, the expansive character of this group of mineral provides the basic for their positive identification when air dry. This mineral may have a basal spacing of 12 to 15 angstrom. After treatment with the uh, glycerol, the smectite expand to a D value of 17 to 18 angstrom. When over dry, the D drops about 10 angstrom as a result of removal of interlayer water. Next is the scanning electron microscope. In this scanning electron microscope, the clay minerals or the clay particles are magnified by almost uh, 150,000 times and they, then they will be identified through this picture. So, for example, we can see individual kaolinite minerals here. But in this case, uh, the elite and montmolite, it is basically like a filmy uh, st uh, structure. Then the differential thermal analysis, in differential thermal analysis, the minerals are heated to a different degree. The differential thermal analysis consists of simultaneously heating a test sample or the soil sample of which we are going to determine the mineral presence and a thermally inert sample at a constant rate say usually 10 degree centigrade per minute up to a temperature of 1000 degree centigrade and continually we will monitor the difference in the temperature between the, sim between the sample and the inert substance. The difference in the temperature between the inert substance and the sample reflect uh, the, uh, the reaction in the sample brought about by heating. And from that, we can calculate what kind of mineral present in it. These are the few points which I discussed in today's class. So, with this, uh, I will conclude this chapter of clay mineralogy. In the next chapter, I will discuss about different uh, properties of the clay minerals, how these properties are different for different minerals and how do they helps in understanding the engineering behavior of different clays. Uh, thank you very much. <music>